What's going on everybody? I'm Patrick Chapla, founder of Palax and creator of Palax Master Coach. And in this video, we're going to be covering the 2017 U.S. Lacrosse rules for the 10U division. So U.S. Lacrosse changed a ton of stuff for 2017 with the purpose of creating an environment that is more conducive and inviting to players of all ages and ability levels. And the reason that they did that is because a lot of players were joining the sport, enjoying it for a little bit, and then actually leaving the sport before they hit 14U. And so U.S. Lacrosse set out to create a ton of new rules, a lot of new initiatives, so that players would continue playing up through high school and beyond. If you'd like to access the entire 2017 Youth Boys Lacrosse Rulebook, you can do so by going to uslacrosse.org, clicking on the Coaches heading, then the Boys Rules heading, scrolling down a bit, and then clicking on the 2017 Youth Rule PDF or ebook. In this video, we're going to start by defining every age group and talk about the field that the 10U players will be using. Then we're going to discuss the mission behind all of the 10U rules and some of the differences that players will see when they go from the 8U rules to the 10U rules. Finally, we're going to cover all of the rules in four separate categories. First will be the game and equipment, then game personnel, playing the game, and finally we'll wrap it up with penalties and fouls. U.S. Lacrosse defines each age group by the player's birth dates, and so they communicate that with the average age of the players in that group, and then the letter U, meaning under. Each age group also loosely correlates to the player's grade and graduation year from high school, but when we're trying to classify an individual player, we will be relying on that player's specific birth date and not the grade or the graduation year from high school. U.S. Lacrosse has created an easy-to-use spreadsheet defining the player's segments. For instance, a player born between September 1, 2009 and August 31, 2010 is a 7U player and is probably going to be in first grade, although there may be some exceptions. The key here is that all age group affiliations will be mandated by age and not grade or graduation year. Each year on September 21st, all players will move from one age group into another and a new yearly cycle will begin. You can find the entire age segmentation spreadsheet by going to uslacrosse.org and clicking the Boys Rules subheading under the Coaches link at the top of the page and then scrolling down till you see the link at the right hand side. As players progress through the youth lacrosse landscape, every two years the rules are going to change. So anybody who is in the 6U bracket or under will use the 6U rules. Then at 7U, they will change to the 8U rule specifications. Then once they hit 9U, they will switch to the 10U specifications. When they hit 11U, they'll go to the 12U specifications. And when they hit 13U, they will play under the 14U specifications. So every two years, the rules and sometimes the field will actually change as players progress through their development. The field for the 6U through 10U divisions is much smaller than that of a full-size lacrosse field. It is 60 to 70 yards long and 35 to 45 yards wide. In its smallest form, it can be placed between the restraining line and the end line of a traditional lacrosse field and can allow for a traditional lacrosse field to be repurposed with two small fields on one traditional field. A midline will divide the field in half and include a 4-inch square, circle, or X that is directly in the center of the midline. Two goals with 9-foot radius creases will be placed 40 yards apart, 20 yards from the midline, and 10 yards from the end line on both sides. The goals for the 6U and 8U divisions will be 3 feet tall and 3 feet wide unless various levels are playing on the same field, in which case a 6x6 goal can be used. Once players get to the 10U rules, a 6 foot by 6 foot goal will be used and it's recommended that it uses a 2 foot drop cloth from the top of the goal to create a 6 foot wide and 4 foot high goal. At any point in time, coaches at the 10U level can elect to build and use 4 by 4 or 5 on 5 goals. The bench, coaches area, and table area will be located on one side mirroring the midline. The table area will straddle the midline totaling 16 yards, with 8 yards on each side of the midline. This is traditionally also the substitution box, but there are no on-the-fly substitutions until we get to the 12U rule set. The coaches areas and benches will run from the end of the table area to each goal line extended, with the bench area starting 3-5 to five yards from the sideline. U.S. Lacrosse doesn't mention a parents or spectator area, but all parents and spectators should watch the game from the opposite side of the field. Although the size of the field stays the same from 6U to 10U, the interactions with the field will be different as players move through each rule specification. 
Also, there is a modified 10U field that can be found in the US Lacrosse Youth Rulebook. The mission behind the 10U rules is to create an environment that players want to come back to again and again. For players who are entering the sport, there's already a vast difference in the mental and physical capabilities of each player as well as their actual lacrosse IQ. Parents, refs, and coaches should emphasize having fun, trying new skills, exploring the actual gameplay, and of course, sportsmanship. The overall emphasis is to instill a love for the game and excitement while playing and developing skills that will serve them in any future endeavor. The experience should provide an opportunity for all players to touch the ball, experiment, and develop existing technical skills. Moving from the 8U to the 10U rules, players will need to get used to playing 5-on-5 five five with goalies rather than 3-on-3, three 6-by-6 three, six six regulation or modified goals, lacrosse balls, face-offs, time-serving penalties, man-up, man-down scenarios, shortened defensive long sticks, and playing four quarters rather than two halves. The game will be played six on six with five field players and one goalie. Keeping score is optional but not recommended by U.S. Lacrosse for this age group. This is also the first time that players will be using an actual lacrosse ball instead of a softer or tennis ball. The competition will consist of four eight-minute quarters with two-minute breaks between quarters. The head of the stick must be at least six inches at the widest point of the head, which is the top right here, and then 10 inches from the top of the head all the way to the bottom of this sidewall. So this does not include the throat section here. Any shooting strings on the head have to be within four inches from the top of the head. So from here to here has to be less than four inches. Also, any of the strings that hang off of the head have to be at a maximum two inches long. A few of the other things that a stick must not do is the following. First, if you're looking at the stick horizontally, you should not be able to see any of the space between the top of the ball and the bottom of this sidewall. Also, none of the stringing should inhibit the ball from actively coming out. So that can be in a lot of ways. It can be with a sidewall string. It can also be with the shooter strings. If it doesn't come out there, you gotta make sure you change up your stick. The only modification that you can have to a stick is putting some kind of wrapping like tape around the shaft of the stick to make it grip better. There are some new things that aren't tape like I think snake grip and some other things that you can actively use, but that's pretty much the only modification that you can make to your stick. Finally, a pull string to make your stick legal is absolutely not allowed and you're only allowed to use one string on the top, side, side, and bottom of the stick. The length of the entire lacrosse shaft has to be between 37 and 42 inches for field players. Defensive sticks must be between 47 and 54 inches long when the head is attached to the shaft. There's no mention of how many defensive sticks can be used at one time in the rulebook, but I'm betting that it's going to be two. Goalie sticks, however, can be between 37 inches and 54 inches long. There's no actual mention of the regulations of goalie head size, but I'm pretty sure that if you just get any regulation goalie head, that that will be suitable. All players must have a lacrosse helmet that meets Noxy ND041 specifications at time of manufacture. It will have this logo imprinted on the helmet shell, as well as a warning sticker. An oral mouth guard or mouthpiece gloves designed for boys lacrosse, shoulder pads designed for boys lacrosse, arm pads designed for lacrosse, athletic shoes or cleats, and an athletic protective cup, which I actually never wore, so I'm kind of glad they're making a requirement, but I hated them when I was little. Rib pads, which go right here, are recommended, but they are not required. All goalies must have a lacrosse helmet that meets Noxy ND041 specifications at the time of manufacture. It will have this logo on the shell of the helmet, as well as a warning sticker. Throat protector that is designed for lacrosse that will hang below the face mask of the helmet to protect a player's throat. An oral mouth guard or mouthpiece. Lacrosse gloves designed specifically for boys lacrosse and hopefully goalie gloves because goalie gloves have much bigger thumb protection because as goalies are making safe, sometimes the ball hits their thumbs and it, the ball can break their thumbs. A chest protector designed for boys lacrosse, athletic shoes or cleats, an athletic protective cup, and then rib pads, arm pads, thigh pads, knee pads, and shin pads are all recommended but cannot increase the size of the goalie significantly. No ice hockey, field hockey, or box lacrosse goalie pads. 
If an official is used, the coach is restricted to their sideline and he can roam up and down the sideline except for the area for the table and the opponent's bench and coaching area. There is no need for officials at these games. The coaches who are roaming the field can handle officiating, but if there is an official present, there only needs to be one. There is no scorekeeper required because no score will be kept. Before the game, a coin toss will be held to determine which goal each team will defend as well as who the first alternate possession is. The winning team of the coin toss will be able to choose either which goal they want to defend, deferring the alternate possession to the other team, or they can choose to be the first alternate possession and allow the other team to select which goal they would like. Before each game, the official will bring both teams to the center of the field and line them up facing each other with their left shoulders pointing towards the goal that they are defending. He will then explain any ground rules and emphasize safety, fair play, and good sportsmanship. To start play, each team has to have one player who is actively taking the face off in the middle of the field, as well as two players behind each goal line extended. Players are not released from the goal line extended until possession is called or the ball rolls across goal line extended. If the ball goes out of bounds, the ball will be awarded to the team that didn't touch it last before it goes out of bounds, except for on shots, in which case the ball will be given to the team with a player who is on the field that is closest to the ball when it goes out of bounds. If the ball gets caught in the equipment of any player or is withheld from play in any way, the ball will be awarded to the opposite team. Play will begin at the beginning of each period and after every goal with a face-off at the center X, which will be conducted by the official. Goals will be disallowed if the period of play has expired, the offensive player has committed a foul, or if the offensive player who scored is found to have an illegal stick. Contact is allowed in five scenarios. Legal holds, legal pushes, trying to edge out a player to get a loose ball, as a defensive player who is trying to redirect an offensive player, and then incidental contact. Legal holds can be administered to an opponent who has the ball or is within three yards of a loose ball and must be done to the front or sides of the other player. If it's to the back, it has to have equal pressure. Players may hold as long as both hands are closed around the stick and they are using their shoulder, their forearm, or their closed fist. A legal push happens after contact has been made. So a legal push is when you're already making contact with a player through a hold and you are pushing them off. There should never be a push that is violent contact in this division. Pushes can be made to the front or side of an opponent and that opponent has to be in possession of the ball or within three yards of a loose ball. Players who push must do so with both hands closed around the stick and use their closed fist, forearm, or shoulder. Contact can also be made when positioning yourself to try to get a loose ball. This is often called boxing out, and what it entails is if another player is coming to get the ball and I want to get the ball, I can step in front and kind of edge him out to try to get the ball, and in that sense, I can make contact in that way. Defensemen can make contact with offensive players who have the ball in an attempt to redirect them. Finally, incidental contact is any contact that was not on purpose. All stick checks must be made using two hands closed around the stick and be administered to an opponent's stick or gloved hand which is on the stick. This can only be done when a player is in possession of the ball or within three yards of a loose ball. The only checks that are allowed at this level are poke checks, lift checks, and downward checks that originate from below both players' shoulders. No offensive players can enter the crease, but they can reach in to try to gather a loose ball. Defensive players can pass through the crease, but they must not have an intent of blocking a shot. The only player who can legally stop a shot in the crease is a fully equipped goaltender. No opposing player can make contact with the goalie or his cross while it is maintained within the crease area. There are no on-the-fly or live substitutions. Whole team only substitutions are the only way to sub players in and out, and so at a dead ball, you have to take all of the field players off the field and replace them with three new field players. The only instance where a single player will be able to be subbed out at a time is if there is an injury and that player must come off the field. If at any time the referee cannot determine who should be awarded the ball, the alternate possession rule will be in effect. So the team that lost the coin toss at the beginning of the game will be granted possession first, and it will alternate from one team to the other after an award has been given. The referee will need to keep track of which team has the alternate possession throughout the game. 
The scrum situation rule is a brand new rule for 2017 and it pretty much just says that if at any point in time the ball is on the ground and multiple players are fighting over it and it cannot be picked up easily, the official can blow the whistle to stop play and award the ball to the team via the alternate possession rules so that we keep the game going. Personal fouls are serious in nature and include either a safety violation or a sportsmanship violation. And so when a personal foul occurs at the 6U level, play will be stopped immediately whether that team has possession of the ball or not. And that moment will be used to explain to the player what he did and most basically be used as a teaching moment. Then that player will have to leave the field and will be replaced by another player. And so at no point in time will a team be manned down in the 6U game. If the personal foul occurred on the defensive end of the offended team, the ball will be granted to the offended team at the center X. If the personal foul happened on the offensive end of the offended team, the ball will be placed as close to where the ball was when the foul occurred and close to the sideline. Personal fouls include cross check, illegal body check, checks involving the head or neck, illegal cross, use of illegal equipment, slashing, tripping, unnecessary roughness, unsportsmanlike conduct, fouling out, and ejection. Each one of these personal fouls is explained in a video following the technical foul video. Technical fouls are fouls of a less serious nature that involve some sort of unfair advantage. So when a player commits a technical foul, it pretty much means he did something illegal to gain an advantage on another player. When a technical foul occurs, play will be stopped immediately and the player who did the foul will be explained what he did and the ball will be awarded to the other team. The ball will be awarded as close to the location of the foul as possible. Technical fouls include crease violations and goalie interference, holding, illegal offensive screening, illegal procedure, conduct foul, interference, offside, pushing, stalling, warding off, withholding the ball from play, and raking the ball. The final rule for youth lacrosse involves terminating a game, and it pretty much says that a ref should do all he can to avoid terminating a game by giving players fouls, ejecting players, and trying to keep the game under control. But if at any point in time the game gets out of control, whether it's coaches, parents, players who are flagrantly doing the same foul or they're fighting or whatever it is, he can terminate the game. If a game is terminated, it's recommended that the game go into the books as a 1-0 win for the team who was not creating whatever the problem was, and that all stats should count towards league records. A cross check is any time that a player makes contact with another player, whether they have the ball or not, with the space between their hands on the shaft. So right here, you are not allowed to push or hold any player with the middle of your stick. All holds or things of that nature must be with the closed hand on the player. So. A couple of discrepancies with this as you'll get into some games. Once you get to higher levels, it seems like a lot of people are allowing cross checks to happen, and they may be, but for the most part, players are trying to direct other players with their fists, which are on the stick, and not the shaft in between their hands. At younger levels, I still recommend that players play defense with their hands like this and not like this, because they will learn how to control and how to use punches with their hand rather than cross checks. Now you may run into a ref who really wants them to go like this, just have the kids adapt that way, but just make sure that players are learning in a way where they know that their hand can touch the opponent, but that the stick between them cannot. Illegal body checking can happen in five main ways. The first way is if you hit a player who is not in possession of the ball or within three yards of a loose ball that is on the ground or in flight. The second way that a illegal body check can occur is if a player body checks another player above the shoulders, below the waist, or from behind. Third, it is an illegal body check if you hit a player who has any part of his body other than his feet on the ground. So if his knee is on the ground, if his hand is on the ground, if any other part of his body is on the ground, you cannot hit that player. The fourth way that illegal body checking can happen is if you hit a defenseless player. And so a defenseless player can be a lot of different things. Here are the three main things that they can be. First, if a player is running up the field and is not looking where he's going and you hit him from his blind side, that is an illegal body check. Also, if you hit a player who is bending down to scoop a ball and his head is down, you cannot hit a player whose head is down like that either. 
Also, if a player is about to catch the ball, say he's catching an over-the-shoulder pass on a clear, and you hit him this way, that is an illegal body check, even if, as he catches the ball and turns towards you, that you hit him then. Pretty much, if he has no time to prepare to get hit, that is an illegal body check. And this is one of the rules that's going to be put down really hard because safety is a humongous concern with U.S. lacrosse this year. The fifth way we can have an illegal body check is an excessive body check, and that is any time that a player ducks his head or his shoulder and hits another player with the intent to put the other player on the ground. Finally, with body checking, it is not considered an illegal body check if one player is going to hit the other and the other player turns his body and makes the player who was going to hit him hit him in the back. If a player has time to react to a player who is going to hit him and he turns his back so that he hits him from behind, that is not an illegal body check. Checks involving the head and neck are absolutely extremely important, especially this year as safety is becoming such a huge concern. So here's what you need to know about checks to the head or neck area. First, no contact is allowed to the head and neck area with the cross or with any of your forearms, hands, shoulders, any of that. But so what'll constitute a personal foul is if any follow through is seen. So say you're playing defense and you're riding someone's shoulder and they kind of duck and it comes up into their neck area. You have to pull your stick off and then regain leverage on their hips or on their arm and you cannot follow through in that area. Now some refs are gonna call you as your stick slides up and hits them in the neck, but the important thing is that there's no intent to injure by actively hitting him. The second way you can get a personal foul with checks to the head or neck is by swinging your stick and slashing them in the head or neck. Now with this, a lot of times a slash will not be called if the stick just barely touches the helmet of a player. So if there's no real impact, sometimes a ref will call a brush and that will not be considered a foul. Finally, this is one of the checks to the head or neck area that a lot of people don't think about, but if the player who is in possession of the ball ducks his head to initiate contact with another player. This is usually called spearing. That is absolutely a personal foul as well. I don't believe a lot of refs are going to call a penalty. They'll probably just turn the ball over, even though any type of spearing should be a personal foul. An illegal stick penalty will be called any time a referee finds that a player's stick does not meet the regulations that it must. An illegal equipment penalty will be called anytime a ref sees that a player is not using equipment that is specifically designed for that purpose as well as for lacrosse. So gloves have to have their entire palm. They can't have big holes in the palm or in the fingers, which you can also use tape if your gloves are kind of falling apart. And also another one of the biggest things that this rule applies to is shoulder pads. Some of the older shoulder pads actually don't have bicep pads that will come off. And if you cut the pad in any way and you modify it at all, it is no longer a legal pad. You have to have shoulder pads that have the Velcro on off bicep pads if you want to take them off. Slashing mostly happens when a player does not hit stick when they are trying to make a stick check. Here are four ways that slashes most often happen. First, and a lot of people don't know this about slashing penalties, if at any point in time a player is swinging uncontrollably, it will be called a slash. Whether or not it hits the stick of the other player or doesn't hit them at all or anything else in that. If a player is swinging their stick uncontrollably, two hands, one hand, it will always be a slash. Next, a slash will be called any time that a player tries to strike another player with their stick and hits anything other than the stick or the gloved hand which is on a stick. So if a player is carrying one-handed, the other player cannot hit this arm. They cannot hit their waist or any other thing. The one time that this is okay and it will not be called a slash is if the player who is carrying the ball turns to defend their stick so that they do not get checked. So if a player is trying to throw a check and I turn and their stick hits my arm because I'm trying to protect, that will not be a slash. Now also with this, anytime a stick hits a player's head, it should be a slash, but if it barely touches the helmet and there's no real impact, oftentimes referees will call that a brush, which is not a slash. Finally, all one-handed checks are considered slashes. Now there's one big exception to this. If a player is trying to make a two-handed check and one of his hands accidentally slides off, that will not be considered a slash. 
Tripping is an obstruction on any part of the body below the waist of a player. And this has to be a primary action where if a player steps in front of another player and trips them, that would be a trip. If they just throw their stick in between their legs, that would be a trip. But the one place that a lot of people think is a trip when it's not is if I'm running down the field and a player tries to check my bottom hand, but they miss my bottom hand and it goes down to hit my leg. That should not be considered a trip because that player was not intending on messing with my legs. Similarly, if a player is going to scoop a ground ball and another player trips over that stick, that should also not be a trip. Unnecessary roughness can happen in three main ways. First is any violent infraction with a push or a hold. So anytime you are extremely violent when you are pushing or holding, that will be an unnecessary roughness call. The next one is any time that a player is set up to have a pick and he's got his pick set, Defensive players are not allowed to run through that player. They must try to get around that player, and if they do hit him, it will be an unnecessary roughness foul. The final unnecessary roughness foul happens when a player does something that is avoidable and also with violent intent. So anytime a player does something that is violent and could have been avoided and isn't really part of the game, that will be an unnecessary roughness foul. Unsportsmanlike conduct fouls are divided into two categories, releasable and non-releasable. The three releasable unsportsmanlike conduct fouls are first, if a player continually commits the same technical foul over and over and over again. The second one is if a player is in play and he gets pushed out of bounds or he runs out of bounds, if he does not come back into the field of play as quickly as possible, that can be a releasable unsportsmanlike conduct foul. And finally, the third one is that if a player continually is not subbing the correct way. So if he continually subs by not running through the box or in a lot of the lower youth divisions, does not wholesale sub every player off and every player on, that will be an unsportsmanlike conduct foul. Non-releasable unsportsmanlike conduct fouls include things like taunting, disrespecting another player or teammate, uh, discriminating against somebody for anything like race, color, religion, anything of that nature. This includes things that are body language oriented as well as verbally oriented and they will not be tolerated by players, coaches, or referees or even spectators for that matter. The second set of non-releasable unsportsmanlike fouls include everybody in your community. That means parents who are on the sideline, assistant coaches, players who are not actually playing, coaches, players, everybody, anybody in the community can get an unsportsmanlike conduct non-releasable foul if they do these following four things. First is initiating an argument with a referee after a call has been made or if they are trying to influence the call that a referee is making. Second is using profane or inappropriate gestures or motions or language at any point in time during the game. Third is to bait or call unneeded attention to yourself by showboating, celebrating, anything that the referee feels is unnecessary. And the final unsportsmanlike conduct foul that is non-releasable is any time that you deliberately grab the ball during a game. This is mostly used during a face-off, but sometimes it happens in the actual game. But So you can absolutely never grab the ball with your hand while playing the game of lacrosse. Any player who accumulates three personal fouls or five minutes of foul time will be fouled out of a game. And so once a player is fouled out, another player from the same team will enter the field after the player who fouled out would have been able to go onto the field had they not fouled out. A player, coach, or anybody that is affiliated with your team can be ejected from a game for one, trying to strike an opponent or leaving the bench area when an altercation on the field starts, also getting a second non-releasable unsportsmanlike conduct foul, and third, any action that is deemed flagrant misconduct by the officials. The crease violation and keeper interference section of the U.S. Lacrosse Playbook pretty much talks about what should happen and how the rules should be applied if the defensive team has the ball and there is an infraction. But so, just so we cover all of the bases, we have to make sure we know that at no point in time can an offensive player step in the other team's crease. So if we're playing offense and a player on our team steps in the crease, it'll be a technical foul, the whistle will blow, and the ball will be awarded to the other team. But so the U.S. Lacrosse rulebook talks about what should happen if the defensive team has the ball. 
If one of our players does step in the crease when the other team has the ball, it will be a play on situation and there will be a flag down, which is going to be a technical foul. So if you can think about a scenario for this, if a goalkeeper is running around the crease and an offensive player riding him runs through the crease, it will be a flag down, but it will also be a play on situation. Any crease violation or goalie interference call that happens that is not a technical foul in nature will result in a play on. And so if the goalie already has the ball and he's throwing an outlet pass and the outlet pass is caught and their team clears it across the midfield line, then the play on will be over and nothing will happen. But if that outlet pass is dropped, the whistle will blow and the goalie who threw the ball's team will be granted possession over the midfield line. If the play on happens when the goalie does not have the ball and the goalie picks the ball up, the play on will be over right then. An illegal hold can happen in a multitude of ways and here are some of the examples. First, if a player tries to use the handle between their hands, this section right here, that will be an illegal hold call. Second, any time a player steps on another player's stick and holds it down, that is a hold call. The third example of an illegal hold is if a player tries to hold a player with his stick. So if I'm defending a player and a player is right in this area and he's trying to move that way and I'm holding him back with my stick, that is an illegal hold. And with that, the fourth example of a hold actually happens if a player is trying to move and I'm holding him against my body with my stick. So I cannot hold him against my stick and I cannot hold him if he's trying to move away. The fifth legal hold that we have is if I try to hold a player with my hand off of the stick. So I have to have both hands on my stick to do a legal hold and if I take my hand off and try to hold with this hand, that is illegal. The sixth illegal hold is if I try to hold the cross of an opponent with any part of my body. So I can't grab their cross with my hand and I cannot step on their stick. The seventh and final illegal hold happens on the face-off and it pretty much just states that I cannot pin another player's head down during the face-off. So if I lose a face-off and my stick is on top of theirs, I'm not allowed to hold their stick on the ground. To go over an illegal offensive screen, first let's talk about what a good screen or good pick is. A good pick happens when my feet are no wider than shoulder width apart, my feet are stationary and I am stationary, so I'm not trying to bump anyone, and my stick is in tight towards my body. So an illegal offensive screen is when any of those items don't happen. So I'm not allowed to be moving to bump another player. I'm also not allowed to have my feet wider than shoulder width, and I cannot have my stick extended trying to bump another player. Illegal procedure is any action on the part of the players or substitutes of a technical nature that is not in conformity with the rules and regulations governing the play of the game. Rather than narrate every single illegal procedure call, I'm just going to put them on the screen and scroll through them. So at any point in time, if you want to stop and read the illegal procedure rulings, you can. Conduct fouls are given mostly to coaches and for the following reasons. First, a coach is not allowed to go on the field, and this is one that I have to work on a lot, and all of my assistant coaches and players know that at any point in time, if I am on the field in a, any type of manner, they have the ability to come and get me off of the field. The second conduct foul can happen if any other personnel is within the coaching area. The only people that are allowed in the coaching area is the coaches. The third type of conduct foul is if any person associated with the team, whether it be a player, parent in the stands, a coach, or anybody else who has an electronic device that is radioing in information to a player on the field. So you can't have an earpiece on the field and be communicating with the player. The final conduct foul is if any person associated with the team commits any type of misconduct towards an official. Interference is when any player impedes the movement of another player when that player does not either have the ball or is within three yards of the ball, whether it is on the ground or in flight. A team is considered offsides when they have more than seven players on the defensive side of the field or more than six players on the offensive side of the field. If at any point in time that happens, that team is considered offsides. There are a few ways that we can incur a push technical foul. The first of which is any push or thrust that is done to the rear of an opponent. That is a push from behind. That is a technical foul. The second way a push can incur is if we incur a violent blow. So at no point in time should we be hitting players with a lot of force. Contact should be made and then a push off should be done to be a legal push. An illegal push is anything that does not meet these specifications. First, it must be above the waist and below the neck and be to the front or side of an opponent. Also, that opponent must either be in possession of the ball or be within three yards of the ball that is either on the ground or in flight. The player doing the pushing must have both hands on the stick and use his gloved hands, forearm, or shoulder. 
A stalling warning can be called at any point in time when a team is not actively going towards the goal. And once a stall warning is called, in which case the referees will go like this, the offensive team has to keep the ball within the restraining line and end line as well as the extended wing lines like we showed you. So they have to keep the ball in the box. The stall warning will end if a goal is scored or the defensive team gains possession of the ball. If at any point in time a player on the offensive team that is within the stall warning steps outside of the box parameters, the ball will be awarded to the other team. During the last two minutes of a game, the stall warning is in effect for the team that is winning as long as they are winning within four goals. So if they have a fifth goal, there is no need to have a stall warning within the last two minutes. Warding off happens when any player who has possession of the ball uses his hand or arm to push off the stick or body of another player. So whether or not you have both hands on the stick or have one hand on the stick, you cannot push off. A lot of players that are playing nowadays do really good job of having both hands on the stick and using their elbow to manipulate the stick checks of another player, and that is now illegal. One thing that you can do though, is you can try to block checks that come in as long as you are not moving your arm. So you cannot push off with your elbow, even if you have two hands on the stick, and you cannot push off regardless if you have one hand on the stick. Withholding the ball from play pretty much means that you cannot at any point in time withhold the ball by laying on the ball, trapping it with your stick. And if you end up doing this multiple, multiple times by just trapping the ball wherever it may be, this can actually result in an unsportsmanlike conduct foul. The final rule that we have, and this is a rule that is in effect from the 6U age division all the way up to the 12U age division, and it is raking. And this is a brand new rule for 2017. It pretty much states that at any point in time, players are not allowed to pull the ball back using the back of their stick in order to pick it up. So players will be forced to scoop through the ball rather than trap it with the back of their stick, pull it back, and then pick it up.